And for those who are not aware, what you see in the back of the picture that I'm the place that I'm standing is a Sagaki Dan. Because tonight we're going to discuss Buddhist ritual, its role in Buddhist practice. Um, then I'll give you just two quick preliminaries. First, this will not be a discussion about Mikyo. So we're discussing ritual, but not Mikyo per se, or, or esoteric practices. Um, it is about ritual as a necessary part of Buddhist practice from the moment that one receives bodhicitta through the well-seasoned practitioners. So this is really aiming not at people who are practicing Mikyo esoteric practices, but for everybody in relation to ritual practice. Uh, second, for this discussion, I'll be speaking as a Soryo Buddhist monk, but also as an anthropologist. So tonight I'm going to wear two hats. Um, but they'll fit together rather nicely, and um, that's all I need to say. So, next slide, please. And I wanted to begin by just giving a little bit of background um, about rituals, because one of the things that I see is that quite often people say, well, I'm really a Buddhist, but I'm not into a ritual. And I think that that notion of being Buddhist but not having ritual is really a postmodern um, process. It's not traditional. And I think that rituals, it, it's interesting, Sangrak Chita, when he's writing about rituals, writes that rituals got a bad uh, rap from psychology because people associate obsessive compulsive disorders and things like that with rituals. And they're really quite different process. Although there is a aspect of something like an obsessive uh, compulsive disorder that is ritualistic, but rituals are really much more, um, as I say here, biosocial evolutionary strategies. The definition of ritual is a ceremony in which actions and wording follow a prescribed form and order. And a second meaning is the body of ceremonies or rites used in place of worship or by an organization. As an adjective, those are the nouns, as an adjective, for instance, in zoology, it's a set of actions that animals performs in a fixed sequence, often as a means of communication. And so we see here the crows, and crows have been studied incredibly, um, of, of, there's a whole literature on ritualism in crows, including how crows bury their dead and the rituals that they perform in relation to the burying of the dead. And so when we think of rituals, rituals are not something that are just a human process. They're something that we see in, in the animal world as well as in humans. And, and in the animal world, and as I say in the, in the handout, apes, dolphins, elephants, crows, and other stars of the animal kingdom appear to lead heavily ritualized lives. And this may seem paradoxic. Why would it, such intelligent creatures waste so much time and energy on apparently pointless activities when they could be doing, could be finding more straightforward solutions to their problems? But this is exactly the power of ritual. It is a mental tool that allows its users to achieve a desirable outcome through obscure means. It's for this reason that intelligent organ, organisms engage in these seemingly wasteful behaviors, not simply because they can't help it, but because they can afford it. In other words, it, it has to have an evolutionary benefit for rituals to be so widely distributed to the animal kingdom and including humans. Next. <laughs> and by the way, uh, you just went, you just passed one, go yeah, back. I don't know why it went. And by the way, the, the uh, citation that you see both at the bottom of your handout as well as on this slide, I think you pronounce it Zagalades. Um, his book, I really, I could have just done this whole program from his book except the Buddhist part because it just came out, I mean, it literally came out, um, I think it was September 30th, and I had it the next day. Um, and he is, an, interestingly enough, has a PhD in anthropology and another PhD in neurobiology. 
And so he's a neurobiologist as well as an anthropologist mm -hmm. um, and studies and studies ritual as, as his, that was his dissertation. <clears throat> and as he says, my findings as well as convergent discoveries from a variety of scientific disciplines reveal that ritual is rooted, rooted deeply in our evolutionary history. In fact, it is as ancient as our species itself, and for good reason. Although ritual actions have no direct influence on the physical world, they can transform our inner world and play a decisive role in shaping our social world. So no other animal uses ritual as extensively and as compulsively as Homo sapiens. In fact, archaeologists often consider ritual to be the one core defining features of behaviorally modern humans because it is rated, related to the capacity for symbolic thought. The performance of collective ceremonies allowed people to set their everyday worries aside and be transported, albeit temporarily, to a different state. And as ritual must always adhere to a rigid structure, participation in collective ceremonies established the first social conventions for early humans. By coming together to enact their ceremonies, practitioners ceased to be an assortment of individuals and became a community with shared norms, rules, and values. And this is why the anthropologist Roy Rappaport declared ritual to be humanity's basic social act. It is how society itself comes into being. And in fact, this may be, in a literal sense, historically true. And I can remember, and, and the book by Roy, Roy Rappaport, I can remember reading that back in the day and just being absolutely bowled over by it. I mean, I, I read it several times, uh, one after the other, because it was so, it, it really struck me. And I have to, I, full disclosure here, somebody wrote in my high school yearbook, the most icon iconoclastic person in the class. And yet I've been so attracted to rituals, you know, the sort of, such paradox in, in that respect. And, and so as a, as a species, we are attracted to rituals. The animal kingdom in, in general uses rituals as a form of communication. And as Roy Rappaport writes in his, his work, that part of the, the role of ritual is to bring people together. To make people feel like they are a unit as opposed to disparate um, autonomous beings. That, especially when you're going from a hunter gatherer uh, collective, in which it might be a dozen or so individuals, up to two dozen individuals, hunter gatherer groups are typically that size, a dozen to a few dozen, um, it would be easy to see the individualization of roles within the hunter-gatherer, though hunter-gatherers don't have defined roles the way they do when we get to state society. I told you I was going to speak like an anthropologist. The way we do when we get to a state society or something along those lines, or even a tribal society. <clears throat> but we see ritual behaviors that are incredibly important among the groups of people that we see in the world today that are still living in pre-modern conditions. Uh, ritual plays a, a highly important process in the cohesive nature of, the, of those groups. Next, please. <clears throat> and so going along to the origin of Buddhist rituals, to best understand how ritual was established in Buddhism, I'm gonna look at it in Theravadan Buddhism in Sri Lanka. That's a, a good place to start and for people we're not aware Sri Lanka was the first place during the Ashokan Empire, uh, the second century uh, BCE, to receive Buddhism outside of the of India, what was then the India uh, kingdoms of India itself. Sri Lanka being an island off to the southeast of of, of India. <clears throat> so Buddhism spread during that period of time, the Ashokan period and it's considered to have retained much of the early Buddhist practices. <coughs> Excuse me while I take a sip of something. And <clears throat> according to 
I'll never pronounce this name properly. Tari Vayasam, <clears throat> the specific form of ritual and ceremony in Sri Lankan popular Buddhism, doubtlessly evolved over the centuries. It seems likely that this devotional approach to the Dharma has its roots in lay Buddhist practices, even during the time of Buddha himself. Devotion being the intimate inner side of religious worship, it must have had a place in early Buddhism. In Sri Lanka, almost all religious activities that have a ceremony and ritualistic significance are regarded as acts of acquisition of merit. This is all this is all the religious activities of lay Buddhism and can be explained oriented toward that end. I wrote about merit in the Shingi this last time. And I think that merit is one of those things that, that in the West, in, in Asian Buddhism, merit is a very, as I wrote, is a very useful mechanism of worship. It's not just donations to keep the structure going. It is a form of worship, and it's expected to have a result. And so in Sri Lankan Buddhist rituals, they're classified under three headings. The first are acts that are performed in order to acquire merit, as we we're just saying. And these include offerings in the name of Buddha and how they are calculated to release one from the cycle of samsara. So by, all, by creating merit or by doing those things that develop merit, one is has an expectation that in the future it's a sotoriological process that in the future that that merit that one has expended will result in fewer cycles of this world the samsaric world this of course is in south asia second are acts that are directed towards securing worldly prosperity and averting natural disasters such as diseases and earthquakes considered forces of evil and as I said, I'm firmly convinced that the reason I got sick is because I did not fast on Yom Kippur and Hashem, God, looked down and pointed and zapped me, and that's why I'm sick. If I, if I had kept fast, I wouldn't be sick at this time, you know, but I didn't, I didn't create enough merit. That's really what it came down to. But David, did you get sick? No, and I certainly didn't fast you. <laughs> oh, well. He likes you better. <laughs> she does. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> and finally, third, are those rituals which have been adopted from folk religion. And, and one, of the things that, one of the things that this writer talks about, as a matter of fact, um, in, in, the, in the article, is how uh, people in... The people in, in the West talk about, I want pure Buddhism. Mm. And this writer goes into detail about how, what the heck is pure Buddhism? Because Buddhism everywhere has amalgamated with other folk religions, and, and like in East Asia, Taoism and Confucianism, etc., and into, into that bond as part of uh, Buddhist practice. And so it, it's really interesting how he, he really this particular author really winds in and out of buddhist and folk religion and provides a picture of ritual in that respect so that the the ritual that we experience from an east asian buddhist perspective japan they might they might have virtually the same intention in a place like let's say myanmar but it's going to look very different because it's so conditioned by the culture that it happens to reside in. Uh, so the most common daily rituals of Buddhists is that of the personal worship performed daily in the home. And you see that throughout Asia. And on the communal level, ritual observed at the temple or monastery, such as what are called Koya days, set aside for the birth, enlightenment, and death of Shakyamuni Buddha, as well as other um, commemorations. So really, when we're talking about Buddhist rituals, we're talking about the rituals not only that occur, let's say in our case, in the temple, in the Hondo, but then there are the rituals that people do at the Butsudan, as it would be called in Japan, the Buddhist altar, Buddhist shelf in Japan, on the Butsudan on a daily basis. And 
So it's important to recognize that ritual is operating on several different levels, not just merely and on the observable level when you go to a service or something along those lines. It's, it's um, on several different levels. So next slide, please. <clears throat> As Buddhism evolved throughout Asia, ritual became increasingly important. And one of the points that we that is made is that re, rigorous contemplative practices such as Vipassana Zen or higher Tibetan meditations are out of the reach of many people. And therefore, ritual forms have provided ways for Buddhists from all walks of life to become attuned to the same subtle dimensions of body, speech, and mind that higher Buddhist philosophy and meditation engage. In other words, most people, if they're living household lives, they're not going to spend half the day meditating or in prayers or something along those lines. They're taking care of their family and going to work and supporting themselves. But the rituals, if done appropriately and done with a sense of, of real, um, and I'll, I'll use the term mindful activity, and bring one to a place that is not dissimilar from those monks who are doing whatever they're doing in the monastery, monks and nuns. And rituals are used to memorialize and the deceased shortly after death and at various times in Japan for up to 50 years. Refuge ceremony is a ritual in which a person proclaims their adherence to the Buddhist ideals and practices, and that ritual is prescribed from the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. <clears throat> Blessing ceremonies of various sorts connote the importance of Buddhism in people's lives. And daily rituals provide a framework for people to orient their lives in a constructive fashion and assist them in adhering to a set of constructive values. In Asia, visiting temples and shrines during various points in one's life cycle and during significant times of the year, such as New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, are a vital aspect of people's lives. And pilgrimages that take place um, throughout Asia are ritualized and meant specifically for the person to attain a higher state of awareness. Offerings are commonly made as a form of devotion. And rituals are not just part of meditation, but are a meditation in and of itself. I think that's one of the things that we that we often fail to recognize is that when we're doing the gongyo, if we're doing it appropriately, it is a meditation in and of itself. It's preparing us to sit in meditation. But even if you don't sit in meditation, if you just do the gongyo with attention, with focus, it's still meditating. And rituals are a part, <clears throat> I'm sorry. The Shoshikan and Makashikan of Chigi stipulates the rituals in the meditation manuals for lay practitioners and monastics. So it was important enough that Chigi included many of the rituals that are performed in those meditation manuals. Even those secularized forms of Buddhism invent ritual to substitute for the traditional rituals that they reject. It's really amazing to see when you go to um, IMS, which attempts to secularize much of, of Buddhism, but in the, the period of time that, that IMS has been, uh, IMS is Inside Meditation Society, which is based upon a Vipassana medit set of Vipassana meditations that arose from the founders' li lives when they lived in Sri Lanka and in, was it Thailand or in Myanmar? I'm not sure, it might have been Myanmar, in Sri Lanka and at the time it was Burma. Um, what, what they've done, because I've taught at, at, at IMS in Barrie, and so it's really interesting. They eschew much of Buddhist ritual, but then they ritualize what they do. So, so they, they, they eschew the notion of the traditions, but then they have developed new rituals because they recognize, that, well, we can't just go and sit down. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. You know, we've got to have something going on here. You can't just sit down and say, meditate. 
you know. So they and and when you think of of many of the people like let's say Stephen Batchelor, who is a, a, a devout secularist Buddhist, and I'm not pejorative toward that, but <clears throat> when I've had conversations with 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 Stephen, he talks about how they've had to bring new types of rituals into their secularized forms because people are really uncomfortable just being presented canonical works and meditation. They need something that is going to, to attract them and pull them in to the process. Next, please. So ritual as integral to Buddhist practice. <clears throat> I'm paraphrasing McCransky. Contemporary Buddhist practices and thought tend to de-emphasize the ritualistic and devotional aspects of Buddhism to newly material resources and strategies for personal and social transformation, which can be related to higher Buddhist philosophy. And while this is important, and this is again uh, McCransky, while this is important, there is a danger that contemporary Buddhists, by reinterpreting practice, as a personal self-help and social services to exclusively in modern material terms may dilute rather than reinforce the beliefs and epistemological intuitions of Buddhism, losing touch with the time-tested means for persons to actually learn to embody an ultimate source of response that transcends the assumptions of modern secular thought. Ritual and the individual practice assist in focusing and continuity and ritual with a group, solidarity, a sense of inclusion, found that, and this was one of the things that was in the, uh, the book on ritual uh, that I found interesting. As a neuroscientist, they found that when people are doing rituals, such as when we're reciting the Heart Sutra during the Gongyo, that people's heartbeats actually synchronize. So when you're hearing that bump, um, Avo, pizza, vara, bodhisattva, etc. The people in the room, their heartbeats begin to follow that until everyone's heart is following the same pattern. Now, I don't, and that explains why some people who have atrial tachycardia, um, you know, sitting next to you might cause you some problems. <laughs> just, just be aware of that. So there's some danger that's involved in that. But, so that on, a, on an individual basis, it help, ritual helps us focus and, and provide a sense of continuity in our practice. And then we're gathered together, then there is, a great, there is such a difference in meditating by oneself and meditating with a the group. They each have their place, they're, they're each beneficial, but they are a different process. They're a very different process. And the ritual that you have with the group serves to unify that group in a way that other things might not. Next, please. And a really brief conclusion, I'd just like to give some uh, a personal perspective on this a little bit. And that is that <clears throat> when I began thinking about doing this talk several weeks ago, I was thinking about specifically how, and, and, and Job had mentioned it in a talk that he gave, that the idea of humanness seen, that is found within specifically uh, Tendai is really geared toward uh, bringing people together in a way that is very useful. And that the individualization this, this, I, you know, the the fission that has been going on in our society. And I wonder the extent to which part of that is that we are getting away from the rituals that bring us together. That part of that fissioning is because we're no longer doing things as groups together in ways that are meaningful that help us to relate to each other. The part of the part of what happens during ritual is you're relating to the other person, not as the other, but as part of what I'm doing, part of, 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 of me. And 
So I, I look at that and I and I really wonder. I one of the things that I would matter of fact last night I was talking with a group of of, of people we were having dinner together and one of the people posed, well, what do you think about the um, the death of Queen Elizabeth and then the you know subsequent coronation of King Charles? Um, and we you know we had I, I don't feel one way or or another about English royalty. Is it good? It's bad. I, it doesn't affect me one way or the other. I'm not English, you know. But what I I, I was sort of fascinated watch the proceedings of the you know moving the body from this per place to that place the ritual that was going on and I realized even if you're a non-royalist or an anti-royalist in England that you still had that sense of ritual that was going on that was still a you could be a unifying force now Realizing that a lot of the anti-royalists will say that's a bunch of poppycock, and you know, all the all the the kings and queens should be shot, and you know, <clears throat> but for the most part, I think that that became a great kind of unifying experience for the English people. And as one of the people said, "Hey, about the only thing that England's got going for it these days are the royals, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and some of those rituals." And and I don't mean I don't mean that in a facetious fashion. I mean that in a very real fashion. That that I wonder the degree to which that serves those rituals that revolve around the royals serve the society in a uni, in a unifying manner. Even for those who don't think that the royals should be getting away with the billions of dollars that are spent on the funerals and coronations and you know all that sort of thing, they still are. They still have sense of place and purpose that takes place during those rituals, and the the other thing. So I was I was thinking about that in relation to uh, American society, North American society, the degree to which um, we have eschewed rituals, and the degree to which that serves to separate us further, as opposed to participating in shared rituals that bring us together.